Hello, and on behalf of the Donner Canadian Foundation, welcome to the presentation of the 2020 Donner Prize. This is my first year as chair of the foundation, and honestly, one of the reasons I signed on was the opportunity to host the legendary Donner Prize Award Gala Dinner at Toronto's historical Carlu. Well, maybe next year. Some of you know the origins of the Donner Canadian Foundation over 70 years ago. William H. Donner, an American-born businessman and philanthropist, had spent much time in Canada, particularly in Montreal, where he befriended Dr. Wilder Penfield and was very involved in supporting medical research at McGill. He created the Donner Canadian Foundation in 1950 with a goal of helping Canada build a better economy, society and country. Since that time, the Donner Canadian Foundation has devoted over $200 million to thousands of philanthropic projects in Canada. Under the guidance of then-chair, the late Alan Gottlieb, the Foundation created the Donner Prize for Public Policy Writing in 1998 to celebrate the best public policy books and showcase the best ideas addressing the many social, environmental and economic challenges facing Canada. With a $50,000 purse for the winner and $7,500 for the four other finalists, this is one of the most lucrative and prestigious prizes for non-fiction writing in Canada. After this past year, Canadians are paying ever more attention to policy. Through the lens of the pandemic, people are assessing governments on their ability to serve and protect them efficiently and equitably. The books that the Donner jury has shortlisted this year truly reflect key current public concerns. I'm pleased now to hand over to broadcaster Farah Nasser, who will introduce this year's stellar nominated books. Welcome to the 2020 Donner Prize. I'm Farah Nasser, and I'm so pleased to be with you. Over the next short while, we will celebrate the five outstanding public policy books, and of course, we will award our winner for 2020. Now, as Greg mentioned, we're experiencing a unique time, yes, but this has allowed us to have unparalleled access to our shortlisted authors. The Donner Prize is meant to encourage an open exchange of ideas and discussions on the challenges our society faces. And to encourage this edict, we have, for the first time, provided students of public policy access to these shortlisted authors to inquire and ask their questions. And in addition, all of our shortlisted authors have joined us live and they're going to be given the opportunity to acknowledge those that have helped them on their journey as we await the live announcement of the winner of the 2020 Donner Prize. Okay, on to the shortlisted books. I'm very pleased to announce that the first book on this year's shortlist delves into 100 years of research to provide an insightful overview of the issues and the solutions related to freedom, security, and crime in modern industrial societies. This is Sécurité, Liberté et Criminalité by Maurice Cousson, published by Septentrion. The difficult problem of the relations between la security and liberty is, in fact, the object of debates constant throughout the 20th century. During these debates, the democracies have finally elaborated solutions that we are the heirs. In analyzing these solutions, we can answer two great questions. How is the security peut elle être assurée sans compromettre la liberté et aussi comment la liberté peut elle être défendue contre ses ennemis notamment contre les criminels et aussi contre les despotes et autres personnages autoritaires par ailleurs il existe en criminologie et en sociologie d'importantes recherches sur l'évolution de la criminalité dans ses rapports avec la sécurité et la liberté. Ces recherches portent notamment sur le Canada et les États-Unis durant tout le 20e siècle. C'est ainsi que euh, l'analyse que j'ai faite dans ce livre des rapports entre ces trois entités tout au long du 20e siècle nous permet de comprendre la relation dynamique qui existe entre euh, liberté, sécurité et criminalité. L'un des grands défis des sociétés démocratiques et des États de droit, c'est de concilier ces deux entités, sécurité et liberté. Nous, vou nous voulons tous que nos concitoyens 
se sentent à la fois en sécurité et en liberté. Car, d'une part, la sécurité est la première des libertés, disait un auteur français, et d'autre part, la liberté est absolument essentielle pour l'épanouissement de chacun et pour que chacun puisse réussir sa vie. C'est pourquoi, après toutes ces réflexions, que j'ai décidé d'écrire ce livre Liber « Sécurité, liberté et criminalité ». Merci. Bonjour, M. Cusson, comment allez-vous? J'espère que vous portez bien. Je m'appelle Anoura Compori, je viens de finir mon Master en Public Policy à l'Université de Toronto, Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. J'ai eu l'opportunité de lire votre livre, Sécurité, Criminalité et um, Liberté, Sécurité, Liberté et Criminalité, excusez-moi. Je l'ai trouvé très, très passionnant. J'ai quelques questions à vous poser sur la page 44, section 3, où le passage suivant. À la longue, trop d'ordre viendra à étouffer la liberté. Il paraîtra insupportable et sera discrédité. Viendra alors le moment de la libération des mœurs. Un passage que je trouve très profond. J'aimerais relier ce passage avec les conditions que la pandémie de la COVID-19 a créées. En ce moment, les médias et politiciens canadiens et étrangers parlent du vaccin passeport ou du passeport de la vaccination et sa future implémentation au Canada et à l'étranger. Ce passeport permettra aux citoyens vaccinés de voyager extérieurement. Pensez-vous que le passeport de vaccination serait une façon de mettre de l'ordre dans les populations et enlever certains privilèges et droits de mouvement soulignés par la Charte des droits et des libertés aux citoyens qui décident de ne pas se vacciner? Bonjour, mademoiselle. Vous me posez la question. Le passeport attestant que nous serons vaccinés ne brime-t-il pas notre liberté? Ma, voici ma réponse. En réalité, vous avez raison. Il est vrai que ce passeport brime en partie notre liberté, mais ce sera la liberté de ceux qui refuseront d'être vaccinés. Les autres jouiront d'une plus grande liberté qu'actuellement en pouvant voyager, circuler, etc. Ainsi, le vaccin nous aidera à retrouver la liberté que nous avions autrefois. Le passeport ne nous prive pas en réalité tout à fait de notre liberté. Plutôt, il nous place devant un choix. Le, le gouvernement nous dit, voici vous avez le choix entre deux options. Soit vous acceptez de vous faire vacciner, auquel cas vous pourrez circuler en toute liberté. Sinon, si vous refusez, vous ne pourrez pas circuler aussi facilement, vous ne pourrez pas voyager, mais aussi, euh, vous ce sera la seule solution pour euh, éviter que vous ne deveniez le vecteur d'une nouvelle contamination. Voilà. shortlisted book had the additional honor of being this year's Massey Lecture. The book discusses the invasive nature of the internet. It also provides the means to rein in the access of social media and guard against abuses of state power, all while preserving the great potential of our communication technologies. This is Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society, written by Ronald J. Debert and published by the House of Anansi Press. Thanks to social media, we have turned our digital lives inside out. We now entrust enormous volumes of data to big tech platforms that have unparalleled insights into our private lives. But there is a dawning recognition that social media are dysfunctional in important ways. 
that they are contributing to a kind of social and political sickness. But what should be done? Where do we start? Reset is meant to be both a wake-up call and an attempt to answer these questions. One of the aims of, of the book is to synthesize what I call the painful truths about social media. Truths because there is a growing number of experts who acknowledge these problems and painful because they describe many serious, unpleasant problems that are difficult to fix. The next step is to move beyond these painful truths and start a conversation about what to do about them. A reset gives us a rare opportunity to imagine an alternative and begin the process of actually bringing it about. To be sure it won't be easy, nor will it happen overnight, but fatalistic resignation to the status quo is no real alternative either. And that is why I wrote Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society. My name is Nick Thompson and I'm currently completing my Masters of Public Policy at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I'm also the outgoing co-editor-in-chief of the Public Policy and Governance Review, a student-led public policy publication at the Monk School. Today I have questions for Ron Deeper, and they're on the book Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society. My question is this notion you bring up that restraint and, and regulation of our online environment should be tailored to match the level of intrusiveness of different practices. You lay this out quite well for surveillance agencies and kind of state-sponsored uh, efforts to, to monitor individuals online. My question for you though is that there are many instances you point to in the book where we find out about intrusive private sector practices potentially long after they've already commenced or when we've been unaware of their extent. How do you see us being able to monitor the level of intrusiveness of the private sector practices, um, such as those mentioned in your book, and tailor a restraint to those appropriately? Well, thank you for that question, Nick. That's a really good one, and it really gets at the heart of some of the issues of the book. You know, we trust so much data to these very large platforms, and yet we don't really know what's going on inside the corporations themselves. They're like black boxes, it's a big mystery. So we need to have some mechanism to peer inside those companies and especially inside their secret sauce, their algorithms, to make sure something's not going on that is contrary to the public interest. And the way I see it, there are two ways that this can happen. One is through some kind of government regulatory inspection. So you have some kind of algorithmic accountability agency that would routinely go in and inspect what these companies are doing in the public interest without giving away any type of proprietary trade secrets. The other way is in a more distributed fashion. And I would use the example of the work that we do at the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. We're constituted as a kind of digital watchdog and we undertake a kind of adversarial form of algorithmic accountability, meaning we inspect what the companies are doing through a variety of methods, sometimes even reverse engineering. So we're not doing it with their permission, um, but we're inspecting what they're doing in the public interest. So those two combined, I think, would be a good way to start making sure that we know what these companies are doing beneath the surface or behind the curtains. One way to think about this is by way of an analogy. So if you think about food processing facilities, we have public health agencies, inspectors, that routinely go into these factories and make sure that the processes they're following are not going to endanger our safety. But we have nothing like that with respect to these enormous tech platforms. We need to rectify that. We need to have some way to pry open uh, their inner workings and make sure that they're being inspected in the public interest. Hey everybody, uh, thank you so much to the Donner Foundation and the Donner Book Prize jury uh, for this uh, short list. And I'd like to congratulate all my fellow nominees who I'm sure agree with me that this is such a great honor. Uh, Reset was written as part of the CBC Massey Lecture Series 
And for me, that was honestly a professional dream come true. I'd like to thank all of the folks at, at CBC, especially Philip Coulter, Greg Kelly, Nala Ayad, Philip for actually suggesting the title of the book, and Hugh Siegel, Natalie De Rosier, uh, principals at Massey College. Uh, the book was published by House of Anansi Press, and they were such a great supportive team throughout this entire process. I'd like to thank Sarah McLaughlin and Bruce Walsh, and especially uh, Janie Yoon, uh, Mary Golakova, and Peter Norman for all of the assistance and su support uh, throughout the writing process. I'd also like to thank my agent, Michael Levine. I hope he's watching now. Hello, Michael. Um, importantly, much of what I write about in research is drawn from my experiences over the last 20 years as director of the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Um, honestly, uh, working with such a dedicated, bright, smart group of people over this time is, is just phenomenal. Uh, each day I wake up and feel like I'm going on a great adventure, um, you know, fighting the good fight. I, I would thank all of the bad actors out there, the autocrats and greedy commercial surveillance companies uh, whose malfeasance we expose on a regular basis, but actually they don't deserve uh, thanks. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank my wife, Jane Gowan, and my children, Emily, Rosalind, Ethan, and Michael, uh, you make the world a better place, and I love you dearly. Thank you so much for this recognition. book on this year's shortlist dissects one of the largest industries in modern society, the government. It pulls back the curtain and it attempts to provide a deeper understanding of the contribution that unelected officials make to the success of democratic political systems. This is The Machinery of Government, Public Administration and the Liberal State, written by Joseph Heath and published by Oxford University Press. The book deals with the question of how civil servants should think about the public good and how it should inform their work. My major reason for writing the book is that while the issue is incredibly important to the quality of government, it is surprisingly neglected. There are literally thousands of books on business ethics, but practically nothing written on ethics for civil servants. I'd also seen some appetite for such a work within the civil service, particularly when it comes to reconciling the commitment to promoting the public good, which is widely shared amongst officials, with the traditional constraint of political neutrality. The old public service slogan, fearless advice, loyal implementation, does not really capture a lot of what goes on. And so I wanted to provide an alternative way of thinking about these issues. And that's why I wrote The Machinery of Government. Hi, my name is Hugh. I'm a student at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and I have a question for Joseph Heath, the author of The Machinery of Government. So in the book, you document how the state has grown in scope over the past century. And as the state becomes you know, larger and more complex, the actions of the civil service become more and more consequential because they are granted a, a considerable amount of discretion in, in fulfilling their roles. And that might be a good thing from a governance point of view, given you know the expertise of the of the public service. But do you think that it starts to undermine our sense of citizens that we are in control of our own future as we start to to see democratic politics shrink into just uh, TV friendly talking points about about a tiny subset of the of the overall issues of the day? So do you see this a, a trade off where as we grant more power to the public service for the sake of good governance? we also start to become less interested in participating in democracy. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question, Hugh. So I don't want to suggest that the growth of the administrative state has been the major factor driving the decline of democracy, or the growing sense you mentioned that the decisions have been taken out of the hands of citizens and their representatives. There's a sense in which power, uh, you know, like nature, abhors a vacuum. People have certain expectations about the role of government in society, and in particular, the problems that they expect the state to solve. 
If one branch of government is failing to act in the face of these problems, power will tend to shift to other branches of government so that they acquire the capacity to act. You can see this really clearly in the United States with the shift of power from the legislature to the judiciary um, and the, the courts, right? But it happens as well with the executive. So right now in democratic politics, there's a very sort of negative dynamic going on of competition that's consuming more and more time, the time and energy of politicians. And that's in turn reduced their interest in governing, or at least it's made their style of governance much more hands-off. So in many cases, that what they've actually done is hand power over to elected officials directly. Um, but in other cases, it's civil servants who have basically stepped up to the plate simply because there are certain jobs that nobody else seems interested in doing. Um, and so I think that the, the so-called decline of democracy is definitely something which is happening um, you know, in the political system. It's not something which is a consequence of the, of the administrative state. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, obviously, thank you very much to the to the jury, to the Donner Foundation, especially to the jury for having sort of plowed through what was uh, at sometimes a rather difficult book. Um, I should mention, so a lot of the book was written actually as material for a course that I teach uh, in the Masters of Public Policy program at the University of Toronto. Uh, and so I, uh, first of all, I should thank Mark Stabile, who was the founding director of the public policy program. First of all, for having gone out and found me and invited me to teach a course on this topic, which is what actually sparked my interest in it. Uh, and then subsequently making it part of the core curriculum. So I've been teaching it for over a decade now. And, um, and definitely the, the greatest thanks has to go to the generations of students uh, doing some quick math and realizing that there's literally hundreds of them who have read, commented parts of the book and participated in classroom discussions and also tolerated sort of long lectures from me on these topics. Uh, so that by far has been the most significant source of, of input and inspiration for me. Uh, teaching public policy students definitely, of all the different parts of my job, uh, that teaching definitely feels like the, the most useful uh, part of my job. Um, I'd also like to thank Peter Olin and Madeline, Madeline Freeman at uh, Oxford University Press in New York uh, for having shepherded the project uh, through to completion. And finally, I know it's uh, somewhat unusual to, to, to thank subcontractors, but I want to actually thank the staff at NewGen in India who produced the book uh, and unexpectedly got locked down halfway through production. And uh, you can see a little bit in the text some of the duress under which it was produced. Uh, but the mere fact that they managed to get the book out uh, under lockdown uh, in the middle of the pandemic is, is something of a miracle. So I wanted to uh, extend particular appreciation to them. Thank you. It is now my honor to introduce the man who has been the chair of the Donner Prize jury since 2017, Mr. David Dodge. It's such a privilege to serve on this jury and get a panoramic view of the topics the policy world is focusing on and what their recommendations are. The purpose of the Donor Prize is to encourage and reward the hard work of researching and writing these probing analyses of public policy issues. And we also salute the publishers who help bring these books to the public discourse. As jury chair, I've had the pleasure of working with an expanded jury of five dedicated critical thinkers this year. Jean-Marie Dufour from McGill University is an academic economist, a policy analyst, an advisor to governments and to the Bank of Canada. Brenda Eaton from Victoria, BC, contributes from her long experience as deputy minister in various BC departments, and more recently as a corporate director. Peter Nicholson from Nova Scotia brings to the jury experience gained from a wide range of posts in government, business, science, and higher education. Joining us for the first time this year is Mark Doxter, past president of the First Nations University of Canada and currently director of the Indigenous Knowledge Initiative at Queen's University. And finally, Glenda Yates, who has served as deputy minister for both Saskatchewan and federal ministries of health 
and is president and CEO of the Canadian Institute for Health Information and is currently on the board of Canadian Blood Services. As a jury, our goal is to draw attention to the books that help inform current policy debate. In this strange pandemic year, our shortlisted books all highlight the need for coordinated public policy at all levels of government, and not just on public health, but the health and well-being of our citizenry and our institutions. So we'd like to thank and congratulate the authors of all the books submitted this year. Choosing these five was not an easy task. And on behalf of the jury, I congratulate the shortlisted authors and their publishers. Good luck to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Our next honoree tackles what is arguably the critical issue of our time, the climate of our planet, and the challenges we all face to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. This book offers solid advice as to how climate-concerned citizens can be more effective and how they can and should be demanding more from their politicians. This is The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success, Overcoming Myths That Hinder Progress, written by Mark Jacquard and published by Cambridge University Press. Humanity has failed for three decades to eliminate planet-threatening greenhouse gas emissions. Yet still, most climate-concerned citizens don't know what to do personally or what to demand from their politicians. On one side, they continuously hear they must change everything about their lifestyles and economy. No more eating meat, driving cars, plane trips, even no more market economy or economic growth. Then on the other side, they're bombarded with political and corporate messaging about how the next fossil fuel project an oil pipeline, a natural gas project is essential for their economy. My book helps explain to non-experts what virtually all experts agree on, that the simple path to climate success might still involve using fossil fuels, but only if we use them without emitting carbon dioxide, which we're te technically able to do. Fortunately, we can eliminate greenhouse gas emissions without destroying our economy or completely transforming our behavior and economic system. We just need to stop the open burning of coal, oil products, and natural gas. But for that to happen, we need more climate-concerned citizens to see this simple truth. And that's why I wrote The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success, Overcoming Myths that Hinder Progress. My name is Taya Koper and I am a Master of Public Policy candidate at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, where I was also the executive producer of the radio show called Beyond the Headlines, which is a weekly radio show on CIUT 89.5 FM that makes public policy issues more accessible to everyday Canadians. So today I would like to ask Mark Jacquard a few questions about his new book, The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success, Overcoming Myths That Hinder Progress. Firstly. Um, is there a particular myth that stands out in terms of it being especially harmful to progress on climate action and thus in need of even more of our attention compared to some of the other myths outlined in the book? Hi, Taya. Hope it's okay that I highlight two key myths out of the many. First is the belief that renewable energy is already cheaper than fossil fuels. I hear this a lot, but it's rarely true. We need every new electricity plant in the world to be zero emission. But natural gas plants are often the cheaper option. We also need every new car and truck to be electric, hydrogen, or biodiesel. But gasoline and diesel made from oil are usually cheaper. When well-meaning people spread the myth that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels, they keep us on our planet-destroying fossil fuel path. Why? Because this myth about cheap renewables lets climate insincere politicians off the hook. It allows them to claim that renewables will replace fossil fuels without requiring carbon taxes and regulations. But in fact, these politically difficult policies are essential and they know it. 
The second key myth is the belief that all countries will voluntarily agree on a fair sharing of the cost of greenhouse gas reduction, and that for the next three decades, not one country will renege on its commitment. Crazy as this sounds, our global climate negotiations are based on this premise, that no country will ever again elect political leaders who put their country above the global interest. In future, will there really be no Trumps or Putins? A climate agreement must include automatic economic sanctions on any climate laggard country. Carbon tariffs are usually what we mean by an economic sanction. But instead of working on that, we annually spin our wheels at international negotiations that assume voluntary cooperation by all countries for the next three decades. This myth has already cost us 25 years of, go of global failure and it mustn't continue. Thanks for your interest in my book, Taya, and for your great question. Hi. Um, I want to, there's a long list of people I can thank, of course, um, and they're listed in the, in the book's acknowledgments. Um, so I think I'll be more general and not name names uh, in this thank you. Uh, the list, of course, includes my partner, <clears throat> my adult children, colleagues, helpful reviewers, and my editor at Cambridge, and especially uh, the many graduate students who've contributed their critical thinking and research skills over a span of many years, in, <clears throat> especially in a graduate course that I teach um, in the School of Resource and Environmental Management at Simon Fraser University. So that's where a lot of the ideas and thoughts in this book um, get generated and refined uh, after I come back to them, you know, from with my tail between my legs from another session of advising politicians and public servants and with small bits of progress and sometimes not so much. More recently, I want to thank Sheila Kay and Sherry Naylor of Naylor and Associates um, with their organizational work at the Donner Prize. And this is because of their generous offer to send to us finalists the books of the other four finalists. And I say this because while I haven't yet had the time to read all of the other four books cover to cover, I have spent considerable time on them, scanning through them, reading key sections uh, in the last few weeks since receiving them. And this has been a fun, eye-opening experience. It's made me feel humbled and honored to be listed with such a group of thinkers uh, and writers. And in that, I, I include uh, the book of Maurice Cousson, uh, a very long time ago, I did my doctoral thesis in France, in French, and so of course I read French, but I haven't read a book in French for about 10 years, and so this motivated me to read his book, which I was very impressed with, and talk about a lot to other people, so uh, just a great idea of Sheila and Sherry, and thank you for that. So what I'm getting at is that, well, of course, I hope to win this prize, I'm actually just really happy to be among this impressive group of authors. So my congratulations to my fellow authors on being shortlisted for the Donner Prize. That's something that we can all celebrate together. Who knows, perhaps one day in person. Thank you. Our final shortlisted book is an in-depth analysis of the current opioid epidemic in Canada, and it's from the perspective of an addiction doctor who is working on the front lines. Politics, socioeconomic factors, and the history of science and medicine are interwoven with the voices of those people suffering from substance use disorders. This is The Age of Fentanyl. Ending the Opioid Epidemic, written by Brody Raman, MD, and published by Dundurn Press. So much about drug use is tarnished by prejudgment and ignorance. By looking deep into humanity's history with opiate use and the experiences of drug policy and drug treatment over the last century, we can get perspective on our current time and think more clearly about what is happening, why it's happening, and what will work to help save lives and move us to a better and safer world. 
In The Age of Fentanyl, I tell the story of the opiate epidemic from my perspective as a Canadian addiction medicine doctor working on the front lines. I wanted my readers to really see and feel what it's like to be in the center of the storm with the goal of destigmatizing people who struggle with substance use and demystifying the interventions and treatments that we use to combat the epidemic. There are steps that can be taken to make a difference. Some can be changed with the stroke of a pen. Some will take years in a cultural shift. We've learned a lot about fighting disease in the last year. We need to put some of that knowledge to use in confronting the opiate crisis. And that's why I wrote The Age of Fentanyl, Ending the Opiate Epidemic. Hi, my name is Faria and I'm a Master of Public Policy student at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. I'm also one of the new executive producers for the Monk School's public policy radio show and podcast, Beyond the Headlines. I'd like to ask Dr. Brody Raman about his book, The Age of Fentanyl, Ending the Opioid Epidemic. Dr. Raman, your book discusses how isolation is a circumstance that can lead to substance abuse. My question is related to this point. Given the instability and isolation that has occurred this past year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, how is this affecting opioid users and what long-term impacts do you anticipate will be a result of this? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. I think social distancing has been a key strategy to reduce the spread of COVID. But what it has meant in practice is that since the spring of 2020, people have been using substances on their own far more which is the most dangerous way to use toxic drugs like fentanyl. We've also reduced the density of people allowed at harm reduction services, at treatment facilities, and in residential programs. And these changes have resulted in greater barriers to accessing prevention and treatment services. As you say, these various forms of isolation have likely been big contributors to the increases in opiate use and overdose deaths that we've seen over the past year. On the other hand, addiction treatment has been able to pivot very quickly to providing virtual care, which in some ways has reduced barriers to accessing treatment. Every day we're learning new lessons about how to keep people safe and engaged in care. Thank you, first of all, to the Donner Foundation and everyone working behind the scenes on the Donner Prize. By shining a light on public policy issues, the prize helps us to engage the public in the ideas and events that shape our society. And it encourages citizens to be part of these critical conversations. A uh, big congratulations to all my fellow nominees. I wanna thank all my teachers, my mentors, my colleagues and role models who took so much time and dedication to teach me to understand the world, to understand medicine, to wanna make things better for everyone. I grew up around the world and I studied and trained across Canada. So thanks to all of you. My patients have inspired me and also taught me so much about their lives, about their health and about what they need to heal. My editors at Dundurn, my agent Lloyd Kelly have all been amazing. My family has been so supportive. My wife, Melissa, my children, Oliver and Beatrice. Thanks so much. I'd like to thank all of our shortlisted authors for joining us live today. It has really been my pleasure to spend some time with you and your books. All the books are making important contributions to much needed policy discussions facing Canadian society. Congratulations to you all. I'll now hand it back to Gregory Belton for the announcement of the winner. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. As you can see, the jury has selected an excellent field this year, and we hope the spotlight of the Donner Prize shortlist will help spread the word on these great books. Additionally, I'd like to thank the five students from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy for their participation. Hopefully, we'll be seeing some of those names on our shortlist in the years to come. And now, the big moment has arrived. 
The winner of the 2020 Donner Prize for Public Policy is... Thank you. The Machinery of Government, Public Administration and the Liberal State by Joseph Heath. Congratulations to Joseph Heath and his publisher, Oxford University Press. Mr. Heath. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess it goes without saying that when I sat down to write a book on the ethics of public administration, it wasn't in order to win prizes. Um, uh, so it's, a, it's an enormous honor. So thank you again to the jury, to the Donner Foundation. Um, I should mention that I've actually been nominated, shortlisted for the Donner Prize in the past. The last time I was I was nominated, it was actually for a popular book that had already, you know, had had, had a certain amount of public impact. Um, and uh, so I felt like a bit of an interloper then, actually, because I feel that one of the things that the Donner Foundation does uh, with this prize that's incredibly important is that it highlights books that might otherwise have been overlooked or that wouldn't have had a big impact on the public conversation. And so I'm pleased to say that this time around, my book actually fits that description. <laughs> this really is a book that not a lot of people uh, would have read, uh, not a lot of people have read in advance. Um, and so um, and there are a number of reasons for that. So I think, you know, again, I just want to say that the, the, the Donner Prize serves an incredibly valuable function, especially in Canada. So the topic of the book, uh, The Ethics of Public Administration, uh, I, I complained in the answer that I gave to the student about how there's not a huge amount of literature on it. Uh, one of the reasons that there's not a lot of literature on it is the fact that it's actually difficult in the English speaking world to have a conversation about uh, government bureaucracy simply because the American system is so different from the British system and from the Canadian system. And so it's hard to say things at a high level of generality. And th so there isn't a huge scholarly literature. In Canada, that, that creates particular problems because our national conversation is so dominated by the United States. Uh, and so we're all kind of transfixed by American politics and American government. It makes it very, very hard to have a conversation about specifically Canadian issues and Canadian government uh, and issues that arise in Canadian public administration. And so a lot of what the book focuses on, actually, is the tension between the commitment to the public good that you find in the civil service and then the constraint of political neutrality. Uh, and that's a feature which is notoriously absent from the American political system. And so the American literature is really of not much use uh, to us. Uh, and so that makes it, you know, so while it's difficult to have a conversation about this in the English language, it's doubly difficult to have a conversation about it in Canada. Um, so that's what the book attempts to do. And the book is sort of unapologetically um, Canadian in its focus on issues that arise in our style of government. Uh, and so I want to mention in particular, and again, thank my editor at Oxford University Press in New York, uh, Peter Olin, um, who, by the way, is secretly Canadian, which I think is one of the reasons he was able to slip this under the radar and get a book that has so much emphasis on, on our style of government to be published by an international press. Um, finally, just as a matter of detail, I want to thank two particular individuals, um, Abraham Singer and Bernardo Zaka, who uh, were incredibly generous with their time reading the entire manuscript and, and ha you know, giving me extensive comments and discussion. Um, I benefit enormously, as I mentioned, from the Monk School of Public, uh, Global Affairs and Public Policy, uh, I've also benefited enormously from the Trudeau Foundation and from conversations I've had with many of civil servants affiliated with the foundation. Um, and I should mention in particular, the person I've probably learned the most from is, is Mel Cap, um, both as a colleague um, and, and as a, a fellow of the Trudeau Foundation. Um, and, but I should emphasize that the views expressed in the book are not Mel's views uh, and that he disagrees with lots of what I've said. Um, finally, I guess um, I should say that when I read the book in retrospect, it seems unsatisfactory uh, to me in many respects. Uh, partly that's because of the sort of exploratory and tentative nature of a lot of the arguments. Um, I, I sometimes write in an attempt to close down arguments, um, but this was a case of writing in, in order to open up arguments and discussion, uh, in part because the, I feel that there isn't enough discussion of this topic. Uh, the major reason, well, one of the major reasons I think is that people think it's going to be incredibly boring. Uh, that I've never understood. It's always struck me as being incredibly interesting how civil servants do their work. Uh, interesting and mysterious. Um, and so, the uh, again, so when I read the book now, I see its many deficiencies. And so, finally, I guess I just want to, again, thank the jury for having overlooked those deficiencies uh, and, and seen the merits there. So, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today and congratulations again to Joseph Heath. 
Our thanks go to the staff at the Foundation, to our excellent jury, to Naylor and Associates for organizing us this year, to Farah Nasser for hosting, and to Creative Harbor Multimedia for this production. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll hopefully see you next year live at the Carlu. Thank you. Thank you.